happen often, but when it does, it is such a blessing to me. And it's happening this morning because I am sharing the platform with somebody who I consider a soulmate, my soul sister, one of my very precious heartstrings. You know her as dynamic, energetic, positive, spirit-filled, God-centered. I give you spirit divine in the form of our own Reverend Sonia Davidson. Wow, do it again. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living. And Reverend John, I do remember also those on the World Wide Web. Wow. Well, please give me a few moments while I boot up. <laughs> You're never too old. <laughs> oh, yes. yes, why not? Right. Can you hear me at the back? Good. My talk this morning, the title of it is To Thine Own Self Be True. Write Your Own Script. Yesterday and for much of last week, our country, Jamaica, was privy to a spectacle rarely seen here. It was a nation unified in celebration of the life of a senior politician and six-time MP, the Honorable Roger Clark. This was a man who marched to his own drummer but was so loved by all and sundry. Does anyone here think he was loved because there was more to him than others? <laughs> could, it be, <laughs> could it be his tweaking skills? You don't need to answer. I don't think so. <laughs> Twerking. Sorry. Okay. Could it be his twerking skills? I don't know. <laughs> Roger's life has got me thinking. His public image did not conform to that of a celebrity. His ample form, good natured bluntness of speech, and sometimes impromptu public behavior made him a media favorite. Not always complimentary. But one thing for sure is that he lived his life his way, and Jamaica cared that he did. The fact that when a person departs this incarnation, there are accolades and even tears is inevitable is inevitable when the life is lived positively. But according to Dr. Ernest Holmes, that is not the purpose of life, to receive accolades, tears, or even to be remembered. I quote Dr. Holmes, man exists for self-expression because he is the expression of spirit. Man does not exist for making an impression on his environment. He does exist to express himself in and through his environment. There is a difference. Man does not exist to leave a lasting impression on his environment. Not at all. It is not necessary if we pass tonight that 
anyone shall remember that we have lived. All that means anything is that while we live, we live. And wherever we go from here, we keep on living. It is quite a burden lifted when we realize that we do not have to move the world. It is going to move anyway." Unquote. This realization came quite as a shock to me when I first read it, but I think I understand. It is impossible to be a light bulb and not shine light. But the purpose of the light bulb is not to give us light. It is to be the light bulb. This realization does not lessen our social obligation, Dr. Holmes says. It clarifies it. It enables us to do so joyously and free from morbidity. We don't have to stress ourselves out to try to make an impression or to be do-gooders. Doing good is a natural to someone who lives from within. How can we live the life that does justice to the life force which brought us into being? Without question, no two people are exactly alike. This is the beauty of God's creation. The more authentically we each live out of that God-given life, is the greater and richer will be our enjoyment of it. People who know themselves and act from that self-knowledge are like the salt which gives flavor to a savory dish. They are living from self-knowledge. They know from whence cometh their help. God, the living spirit almighty. And I quote, my title would be familiar to those of you who are Shakespeare, what you call students, Reverend Mike. It was a quote from Shakespeare and it is, was put in the mouth of one Polinius. This above all to thine own self be true. And it must follow as the night follows the day that thou canst not be false to anyone. Wow. What does it mean? I don't know what Shakespeare meant when he wrote the words, these immortal words, but frankly, it does not matter to me. What matters is what it means to me and to you. The self that I acknowledge is a unique expression of the infinite God which shaped everyone out of its image and likeness. The beauty of our self, the self is the power which we must grow to know and reveal to others by the lives that we live. Often we have lost track or never really discovered the real self. So we are not aware that we are enough because that self, the self which is God, is all. Self-awareness is the prize of the person who is courageous enough to confront their own demons rather than to blame the world. The self is so exquisitely lovely. The self with a capital S. It is always there waiting for us to discover it. It is the divine spark, the Christ, the Messiah, the consci consciousness which liberates. It is that which be, will be the pilot, the co-pilot, and the vehicle of further growth. That which will take us through life's journey in this incarnation and throughout eternity. It is an unavoidable fact that we are made in the image and likeness of God. 
We have God qualities, but we need to unveil it, not cover it up with false images of who we think we are. The real you is waiting to take form as your uniqueness. The seed of life that is planted in us is like none other. To allow it to grow is to experience power, peace, and joy along the way. So that when it is time to step out into the new experience of life we call death or transition, we can confidently say in the words, I understand it is the words of the singer Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. Your way is God's way for you as you. It is a testimony to your freedom. But how can you, if you exercise that freedom in a grand denial or grand cover-up, the facts are nothing is really covered up that is buried inside. It must take form according to how the law of mind works. Others see the naked truth about us, not necessarily with their eyes. What they see is what we are feeling and thinking and their reactions are their feelings about us. Our influence grows in ever-widening spirals as we go into a greater understanding of the things we need to change and about how we see ourselves and how we see others. We need to face the facts and know the truth. We need to think highly of ourselves as expressions of the self while facing the facts about where we are in our present spiritual development. If we are constantly thinking, doing, reacting, being treated like uh, put down, bypassed, then it is time to do some introspection. And then we must fess up to no other than who? Ourselves. This is the beginning of progress. Tyler Perry, now famous producer, shared with the public that he had lived with anger at his father, who had in Tyler Perry's mind done a disservice to his estranged family. Tyler Perry met many adversities in life. Eventually, he met rock bottom, homeless, and living out of his car, struggling to survive. One day, the burden of his anger towards the father became so great that Tyler decided to visit his father and to let him have a piece of his mind. He did just that. Never sugarcoated his words, just unburdened his soul. A strange thing happened. A feeling of deep relief came over him. The anger disappeared and Tyler went his way in peace. Not long after, life took a turn for the better. And the rest is history. Tyler Perry is today a very, very rich man. And more important, his work continues to be an inspiration to many. There is nothing too ugly about the human life or experience that we cannot change. We can change the way we look at it and change it to how we want to see it. There's a very wonderful quotation on our Facebook page, which I visit very, very often, and I am encouraging you to do the same. It's from an Elaine White Feather. Everyone has burdens and wounds in their lives. 
we may make them our identity or we may choose to grow from them and live more empowered and soulful lives. I remind you, this above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night to day, thou canst not then be false to anyone. When you first enter into conscious self-discovery through self-reflection, it may be like walking into a darkened room, which I tried the other night. I knew where the switch was, and you know where the switch is. You cannot see it, but you know that there's nothing else in the room. Yet, you know there's nothing to harm you, but yet there is some reticence, some reluctance, as you try to feel your way. You might stumble over an obstacle here and there. This is a room that you have lived in for 40 odd years, but you still stumble over an obstacle. You know exactly where that is. You may even fall. I didn't. But you know that the light is there, and you intend to turn it on. You reach for the switch. You keep on going. And without even seeing the switch, you reach for it, your hands touch it, voila, the light is on. That is how it feels like to walk by faith and not by sight. No need to fear, we know that the light is there and we know our own souls. It's just that we sometimes are afraid to explore it. In the Science of Mind textbook, there's a quotation which came to my attention again. The criterion for any man as to what is right or wrong for him is not to be found in some other man's judgment. The criterion is, does the thing I wish to do express more life, more happiness, more peace, and at the same time, harms no man? If you haven't got a sense of mind textbook, get one. If you have one, look for this page 270 and read the entire page. It is very enlightening. And also, taken from our Facebook page, which I am again inviting you to visit, you can start the day anytime after midnight with an affirmation. And this one that I took is particularly applicable to my talk. It says, I forgive myself for any possible mistake that I may have made. I live eternally in the now in the presence of God. I let go of every previous interpretation of myself so that the presence of the now frees me from limiting emotions resulting from looking outside myself for my good. I am free to love and to live for I know that God is already complete as me. And I'm going to repeat the last sentence and I'm going to invite you. After I've repeated it, I'll break it down and I'm inviting you to say it with me. I am free to love and to live for I know that God is already complete as me. I am free to love and live. I am free to love and live for I know, for I know that God is already complete as me. God is already complete as me. Tom Thompson says, write your own script, write it. And too often we have learned to think of ourselves as something that we really are not, only because someone else has told us that this is what we should be. Too many of us have been given misinformation, he says, by the world. 
Because, guess what? The world has no idea what we really are about. So we must make it our business to know. And there's a story that I keep revisiting because it is rich. Every time I revisit it, I have, I see, have some different insights into it. And it is drawn from the biblical story of Joseph, the son of Jacob and Rachel. Joseph was distinguished as a favorite of Jacob and also as a dreamer. He would very frequently go to Jacob and keep him up to date with what everyone was doing and frequently dreamed and interpreted his dreams and he just told everyone about it and the dreams were really favorable about him. So guess what? His brothers couldn't stand him. He had 11 brothers. Nobody wants somebody who keeps going to daddy and who has dreams and all the dreams are so favorable about you. So the brothers conspired to get rid of him. And so they sold him and to the first passerby and gave the father the impression that he had died. Eventually, Joseph was sold into slavery in, e in Egypt and he was sold to a very rich man called Potiphar. And what is interesting is that Joseph never stopped dreaming and never stopped sharing his dreams even though it had landed him in trouble. He persisted. And so he told Potiphar some interpretations and they came true and Potiphar was very impressed. He exalted him and he gave him stature and status, gave him things. But something again unfortunate happened to Joseph. Potiphar's wife attempted to seduce him and told a lie on him and guess what? He ended up in prison. In prison, guess who Joseph shared a cell with? Pharaoh's butler. And he again dreamt, interpreted the dreams, and the dreams came true. So the butler was very impressed. So later on when the butler was released from prison and went back to Pharaoh, Pharaoh had a challenge and he remembered that Joseph, the dreamer, might help. It was the same time that there was a lot of, um, just like we, are, we had the other day, we had drought. And uh, that was on the horizon. But it didn't, it wasn't apparent at the time, but Joseph dreamt and was able to predict that there would be a drought and warned that there should be, oops, <laughs> and warned that there should be a, um, <laughs> Okay, and warned that there should be storage of the grain. And indeed there was the drought. So then again, up more, he was given an exalted position. And he was supposed to know, be the keeper of the granary. No, who turned up when we had the drought? We all know the story. His brothers came, they didn't recognize him, but Joseph recognized them, but he didn't tell them anything. He kept one of them behind and he said, go, go back and bring your brother, right? Go back to your father. The father wasn't too uh, happy about that, but because they were in danger of being starved to death, he eventually gave in. When they came back with the brother, Joseph told them who he was, and he forgave them. No, the thing that grabbed me about Joseph this time was that he was a bit of an eccentric, you know. You can imagine somebody walking around and telling you about their dreams all the while, right? On top of that, he had this extraordinarily loud coat. Everybody could see him at a distance, right? I mean, really and truly. So, but he did not bow. He kept, even though he landed in all of that trouble, he just kept true, true. Eventually, he did get 
lots of glory. He had seen it. He got glory and he got fame, but something was missing for him to stop getting repeatedly into that kind of scrape. He needed to make a connection again with his family. No, that story of Joseph could be our story, our consciousness, our own consciousness when we are young in this. Joseph was young when he was carrying on like that first and his brothers sold it. When we are young in this kind of teaching, we may in fact be more bent on acquiring and lording according praise and you know everybody knows wow we can we know the science of man but what happens if we keep focused if we keep our minds centered what will happen eventually yes we'll be exalted but not until we return remember he always went to the father he kept going to the Father. He had forgotten. He was cut off from the Father. So not doesn't matter how we demonstrate all the wonderful things using this teaching. We must never forget that it comes from the Father. And so when Joseph was able to go back within, back within, connected with the Father again as we must, that was the end of his problems. He lived until a grand old age, I understand that from the Torah that he lived until 110, right? And remained in Egypt and asked for his ashes to be taken when they went into the promised land. Now, friends, Ernest Holmes advised us, do not dwell on adversity. Joseph didn't. For there is power in the word. He says, meditate on the things you are doing as being already done, complete and perfect. Keep your focus. Try to sense the infinite life within you and around you, he says. Meditate on this life until your whole being flows into it. That's your preparation for your treatment. Really, really know from whence cometh your help. God is Therefore, I am. Now you are ready to prove your principle by allowing this life to flow through, he says. The thing you are working on and for, it will flow through. It is the spirit, the living spirit, that must be a part of it, lest you get the things you want, but it's bittersweet. And again, Ernest Holmes, he says, try to contemplate the presence of God as our true identity, our true identity. That is who we are. No matter what is going on in our lives, I say, we need to remind ourselves that beneath it all and within us, God, the I am, that which changeth not is there. And there's a a particular imagery that helps me a lot when things seem to take my attention away from exactly who I am. It is the ocean. The ocean does not change when it produces a wave, and the wave does not give up the attributes it derives from the ocean in the process of becoming a wave. Furthermore, a wave never departs from the presence of the ocean. It never loses its connection. It could not. It does not. The wave cannot be known as anything other than the ocean appearing as a wave. We too must choose to know ourselves as a point where God appears. Whenever you feel disconnected, just put yourself as the wave, that wave flitting around, connected to the infinite. It is important that we live our lives by choice and not by chance. And that in choosing, we choose always to be ourselves. This is freedom. For freedom means to thine own self be true. It means living by the script which we have written for ourselves, rather than trying to live by the script that someone else has written for themselves or for us. It means 
that at the end of each day, we can say triumphantly, I did it my way. I have been true to myself. Namaste.